Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director, at least I am for the moment, the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. We've been in virtual mode for, what, almost two years. We're now in hybrid mode. Uh, we're sort of mixing and matching real-world events with uh, continuing to build up a, a video library of the same sorts of topics as we were looking at in the real world before the pandemic struck. Quite a lot of the videos that we've put on our website, and there are now about 380 of them, uh, have to do with uh, important books. And this, I think, is a really important book. It's called Cogs and Monsters, What Economics Is and What It Should Be, and the author is Diane Coyle. I've known Diane Coyle for quite a long time, since she was uh, an, a, a journalist on The Independent. She had before that been a treasury economist. She uh, went into to the Investors Chronicle, then to the Independent, and then, as it were, back into academics. She's also been on just about every committee uh, that the UK government sets up. She's been a vice chair of the BBC Trust, and she is currently, having been a professor at Manchester, she is now a professor of public policy at the Bennett Institute in Cambridge. She's written a number of books, all on sort of really on the same kind of theme, that economics is locked into uh, thinking, as it were, of the last century. It tends to look at things that it can weigh. Uh, her first book, I think, was The Weightless Economy, and she's expanded on that. Uh, and the, her latest book, Cogs and Monsters, is, I think, uh, the most important book that she's written. And I've read, I think, pretty much all of them. It's an, it's an easy read in the sense that she, as a former journalist, writes beautifully and you, it's not terribly technical and you can zap through it. But you can't. The point is you can't really zap through it. I found it actually very difficult. I found it difficult because there was an idea on almost every page that stopped me and forced me to think. And as a result, I'm not quite sure that I picked up the main themes of the book because I've been going off in my own little digressions everywhere. I'm, a, I'm an economist. I suppose I'm an economist. I suppose I'm a macroeconomist. She is a microeconomist. I'm not quite sure. I've never been quite sure what the boundary between the two is. But I come at economics from a sort of development perspective, from a political science perspective, from an international relations perspective. And every time I see dynamic stochastic equilibrium growth theory, I want to beat my head against the wall and die. Uh, I think uh, she is a much better economist than me, a PhD from Harvard. Uh, but I think she has some of the same concerns about the, uh, the, the discipline, the way it's going, the way it's reacting to the digitalization of the world, and the way that it is sort of locked in a kind of, uh, a kind of mechanistic model. Tell us a little bit about what drove you to write this book, uh, Diane Coyle. Diane. Andrew, thank you for the very generous introduction. This means that we've known each other for more than 20 years, <laughs> and it's now almost 25 years since I published my first book, The Weightless World, about the impact of digital technology. Um, and as you say, I've had some constant themes over time, and one of the motivations for writing all of the books, including this one, is that there are criticisms of economics, which to my mind misfire. They tend to focus on using um, mathematical models when every discipline uses models and algebra is just the language of logic that we use in economics to uh, be able to implement things empirically or they would focus on um, assumptions about rationality when economists do know really that we're not all rational all the time, but it's a, a, a sort of thought experiment starting point. I wanted to focus people on what I think are the um, fundamental criticisms of economics now. And um, this is what I'm advocating for in Cogs and Monsters. And there are three parts to it. One is about the lack of social diversity in the economics profession itself, which means that it's going to be inadequate as a social science and particularly one that has a lot of influence on government policy and business decisions. A second is the very um, deep seated idea among economists that what we're doing is um, only uh, like engineers of society, we're looking at a situation and analyzing it objectively using evidence and devising the best possible um, intervention or action in those circumstances. And that's something that you can do independently of making value judgments. And that's something that's been deep seated in the profession since the 1930s. And I think it's just fundamentally wrong. 
and comes from a confusion in economics itself um, about the word efficiency. We call things efficient and it's not the same meaning as an engineer calling something efficient. It's a, it's a value laden concept of efficiency. And the third is that although I'm, a, I'm an economist, I'm a, a conventional economist, not heterodox and um, think the subject is incredibly powerful and full of insights for real problems. The starting point that we have, that we're all socialized into from our earliest days learning about the subject is um, so far from what the economy has become that we need to ditch it and start from a different kind of um, uh, initial framework which you use to try to understand the world. We learn about a constant returns to scale world where there's perfect competition and perfect foresight and people's preferences are fixed and there are no, there are no externalities, no non-rival goods like data and intangibles. And actually the economy is now so different that that starting point just makes our analysis and advice um, uh, unsuited for the economy we're in. Yeah, now, it, some of the critiques of the book, I was thinking in particular of David Henderson say, uh, basically that, okay, you know, we economists have been thinking about these things and we're not locked into a, a sort of last century way, view of the world as you're suggesting. Uh, I, on the other hand, tend to agree with you that, uh, that we, we are looking at, we measure what we can measure, we see what we can see, and the world is very, very different now. How do you dismantle uh, the whole infrastructure of economics and start again? Because that surely is the implication of the third critique that you're making. You really have to go back to basics. In a way, we need to unthink the economics of the last 50 years and start again. The response that um, someone like David has given me, I get from many economists and they say, well, of course we understand that there are increasing returns and in, intangibles in, in are important. And there was a fantastic paper in Econometrica about this only a little while ago, and which of course is true. And economics has made tremendous strides. And there are lots of good things that have been happening. My point is really about that benchmark model and where that takes you to in thinking about policy or uh, business actions. And um, so take, for example, the idea of uh, increasing returns to scale being everywhere. Th th there are always increasing returns to scale industries. Think about aer aer um, aerospace or automotive. But in the digital world, it's all increasing returns. There are no constant returns businesses now, unless you're thinking about the local cafe. And so starting from a, a benchmark of the, the constant returns world where things are linear and you can have that sort of perfect competition is just the wrong place to start thinking about digital markets, which are always inclined to be winner take all markets because of network effects. And the, the policy places that you start are just so different. <clears throat> take competition policy, which I've thought about a lot over many years. What um, economists do when they're analyzing competition in the market traditionally has been to think about a given context and who are the potential entrants at any moment, what are the um, short-term dynamics of competition in the market, how are prices set, what are the barriers to entry. And um, they do that from this perspective, uh, which is deeply embedded, of being a scientist in a white coat looking down on it from the outside. In digital markets, the, the way that they tip very quickly to have a dominant player, and we see this in all of the big tech companies and the concerns about their market power now, means that any decision that any regulator or competition authority takes is going to affect the future of the market. You can't not affect the dynamics. And an example that I often give from my own experience is the Competition Commission in 2009, deciding that the BBC, ITV and Channel 4, the public service broadcasters, could not combine in a commercial joint venture to do a long form video platform. They would have created something like Netflix before Netflix arrived. And the competition authorities, I think, misunderstood the nature of digital platforms, which is that you need to build up both sides of the platform. So to attract viewers to that kind of platform, you need to have as much content as possible and so they would have had strong incentives to allow competing content onto the platform. They wouldn't only have shown their own content. But anyway, the decision was that they couldn't combine for five years. 
which is an unbelievable amount of time when these markets tip so quickly. And the result was that Netflix did get into the market and uh, has become the biggest broadcaster in the UK. But the point of that is, whatever they had decided in the Competition Commission, it was going to determine who was the dominant player in that market. Would it have been public service broadcasting companies, their commercial activities, or would it have been Netflix and they chose Netflix? You can't not choose. And therefore your analysis of these markets needs to start in a completely different place in the conventional way. But what then, okay, let me ask you specifically with the big platforms now, with Google, with Amazon, with the big tech companies, where should they, where, how should we look at competition in these particular areas? I mean, should we actually try to break up the fangs? Should we uh, say, okay, these are completely, these are now platforms with increasing economies of scale, we, we, we must live with them, or do we actually try to take a proactive view and actually break them into constituent parts? Well, this is a very live debate, as you know. I'm not in favour of breaking up because a lot of the benefit that consumers get from the platforms does come from the network effects that make them big. So my focus has been on making the markets contestable, to use the jargon. Could somebody else come in and replace Google as Google replaced Yahoo or replace Facebook as Facebook replaced MySpace? And the suspicion is that that can't happen, that they've now become so big and um, expanded into so many neighbouring areas that it's very hard for consumers to switch away from them and go to a newcomer, even with better technology. And so the kind of remedies that I've been thinking about have been um, uh, regulation to create a contestable market. So for example, let's think about mandating data access, not by transferring the data that they've accumulated, but by mandating that they, that they must make it available um, with certain metadata and standards to other uh, entrants to the market who could then use that customer data to deliver better services and have some chance of competing. So that would be an example of pro-competitive regulation, and that's the kind of approach the EU is thinking about also. We don't know if it will work. And so the, I wouldn't want to take breakup um, uh, away as a possibility at some stage in the future if it doesn't work, or equally regulating as a utility at some stage. Mm. Um, but there are other complexities here as well, aren't there? Because these are powerful companies, mm. and there is politics involved and geopolitics involved, mm. because for a small European economy, uh, relative to the US and China, these are big US and Chinese companies. So I think one also has to take account of the politics of this and the um, political courage it would take, actually, to do something very interventionist um, when um, so many people in this country get enormous benefits from all of these free digital services. Yes, that, that's the point, isn't it? They are free, and that complicates the whole model that we have under underlying uh, sort of the, the kind of stage of capitalism that we're at at, at the present time. I mean, I'm, I'm worried, I suppose, because the implication of what you're saying is that the regulators have to grow almost as big and as powerful as the companies that they're regulating, and that seems to me to be a kind of arms race that nobody can win. Uh, we're just going to build lots and lots and lots of inefficiencies into the system. Uh, we don't have if you like, a, a self-regulating mechanism anymore. I mean, I've always thought that capitalism would be perfect if, you know, we said to, uh, to, to a company, you're allowed to compete until you get, say, 60% of the market, then we break you up and we give you a gold watch and you get to start again. That's sort of automatic. There is no automaticity in what you're suggesting. The regulators have to regulate, 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 which really means that this isn't what we know of as capitalism, it's a sort of state corporatism. Is well, I, I would disagree about that, Andrew, because mm -hmm. the kind of regulation I'm talking about isn't um, the uh, behavioural regulation that you're describing. And that is, of course, um, a double-edged sword because regulators can interfere in very counterproductive ways. And we've seen that mm -hmm. in lots of industries. I'm talking about really setting the rules of the, of the, of the game in which the market operates. And governments have always done that. So I would draw an analogy, for example, between regulating, regulating weights and measures, which we've had since medieval markets, and regulating data standards of interoperability and metadata and um, uh, the open software standards. So I, I would draw that comparison. I think it's a very different kind of regulation. Um, it almost not really regulation, but, but setting the rules. Mm, okay, I mean, okay, if I, if I see that, 
that right. Let me let me ask you another question. I mean, you talk about the digital economy having effectively changed the entire global economy. For the, the looking at sort of two thirds of the world, it hasn't, has it? I mean, two thirds of the world still face declining economies of scale. Uh, it's agriculture based. It's um, it's a very the poor world has be, become detached from the digital world that we know in the West. Um, and therefore, there are effectively two economies running at the present time. What the arguments you're making, I would have thought, apply mostly to the form of capitalism that we have in the advanced north. The, the form of capitalism that they're still striving for in the less developed south is a very different kind. Is, would you accept that as a, as a potential critique of what you're saying? Well, of course, the um, structure of the economy in the rich countries is very different from that in the poor countries, as you say. And the countries that remain very low income are reliant on either natural resource exploitation or agriculture. And um, you can see productivity gains, and I think there's a lot of scope for productivity gains in agriculture in low-income countries, um, you, including using digital tools. But of course, it's true that the structure of their economy is very different. So there's a, a live debate now in economics about are there pathways to development um, that somehow miss out that low value uh, to high value manufacturing process that the successful middle income economies like China or um, Thailand and Malaysia have, have gone through. And um, we're kind of testing that at the moment. Having said that, there's a lot of digital in low income economies as well. And the mobile revolution from the mid 2000s um, is, is, is part of what's driven that. If you look at an economy like Indonesia, they have some very successful internet-based companies, including some quite large ones that compete effectively in the country with, uh, with the big tech companies. And that just raises a different set of questions about uh, their even greater reliance on something like Facebook as infrastructure. And perhaps that means they would need a different sort of regulatory model. Perhaps it's more like telecoms regulation in their case than the kind of setting the rules of the market that I've just been describing for mm. a country like the UK. Well, go go back to the the, the possibility you gave gave us an alternative the regulation of the big platforms as utilities. Is is that something that you would only come to very reluctantly? I would um, prefer it less for the kinds of reasons that you just set out yourself, Andrew. That um, you know the asymmetries of information between a regulated business and a regulator, and the um, uh, complexity of network industries just makes them quite hard to regulate effectively. And any intervention can have counterproductive effects. We've seen a great example here with Ofgem recently and what looked like very sensible regulation to stop customers being price gouged by the utilities in normal times actually has backfired quite badly at a time when um, energy prices have spiked so much. So it's just really hard to do that way. And, um, so my preference ordering is to try reg reg regulation or shaping the market uh, structures and then to try utility regulation and then, if necessary, to try break up. You go back to uh, to the, the three three uh, issues that you posed at, the, at the, the beginning. The very first one was the lack of diversity in the economics profession. I mean, I've heard you. I heard a piece that you gave to the Resolution Foundation where you also said uh, you put that up first as as being the issue. Uh, that sort of you 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 tended to talk about gender diversity, but it's also sort of quite frankly ideological diversity that's lacking, is it not? I mean, it's uh, you you defined yourself as a conventional economist, but in some sense, like it or not, you are a, 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 a gadfly at least as far as the conventional economists are concerned. Even if you aren't a modern monetary theorist or you know a heterodox economist of one one shape or another, I mean there is a sort of um, there is a collegial feel uh, that you've got to subscribe to a certain canon of uh, of, of 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 thought or way of thinking uh, that is that goes beyond simply gender diversity or indeed ethnic diversity. I mean, what what kind of diversity are you really looking for in the industry? Well, I, I am um, thinking about um, diversity of experience and ways of thinking. So we use the standard gender diversity or ethnic diversity or class diversity as the markers of that because they're things that we can measure, although gender diversity is measured better than the others. Um, 
But as you as you're suggesting, it really is about people who've got different kinds of experiences in um, the way that they have come to the discipline, because a social science needs to understand the full range of experiences in society, to know what questions to ask, to understand some of the constraints that make people decide things the way that they do, and um, even to understand what data means, because data is constructed and collected within social categories. So all of those conventional forms are very important. Any department in a university, and, and I think economics is particularly bad, um, te has tended to become quite narrow, I think, because um, higher education rewards people for publishing in a certain number of journals, and um, they tend to have, have this intellectual conformity that mm. you were describing. I wouldn't call it ideological, it's not a left-right thing, but it's, it's a way of thinking about the world. Economics is worse than many because we only have five journals that count. So it's, it's ludicrous. And there are all kinds of fantastic field journals that are excluded. Um, but it means that um, to be appointed and promoted in a good economics department, you've got to have published in those five journals. It's a really narrow bottleneck. And so you get a certain kind of people addressing a certain kind of research question in economics departments. Yeah, you are a, uh, a senior independent member of the ESRC Council, or you, and you know, isn't it part of your job, to, in a way, to break up the power of the ESRC, which is disproportionate within the industry, and particularly in this country, isn't it? The Americans that's don't not, have quite no. That's not correct. ESRC is not a major funder of economics in this country. Um, there are lots of funding sources, and um, you know, ESRC has a leading role to play, and actually. Um, really highlights the need for interdisciplinary work, for example, in funding decisions. Um, it isn't a single body that can fix this. It's a, it's a system problem. And part of that system is departments themselves have to be open to a much wider range of promotion criteria. Mm -hmm. And um, what stops them doing so is that they fear losing out against other departments. So they will have to discuss it among themselves. And they've got vehicles to do that, like the Royal Economic Society and the heads of departments um, uh, uh, body, so they, they could do that. But there's a kind of fear of moving, I think. But I, I sit in a politics department now. A lot of more adventurous economists are, but first of all, more senior, so they don't need to worry about promotion criteria, and are in business schools or politics departments or elsewhere. Uh, but I think there's great interest in economics departments in finding a way to break out of this uh, narrow perspective that they have imposed on themselves. Um, but I think it's a little bit more complicated than you're painting it, but, but I'm, see, I'm seeing some positive signs. No, I, I'm, I'm sure it is enormously complicated, but the fact that you flagged it there, that really does seem to be part of the problem within economics. Now, you're, you, you're suggesting that in a way you have escaped from the, the narrow bounds of an economics department by going to a politics department at Harvard. I assume the same is true. You know, the heterodox thing is end up at the Kennedy School rather than the Department of Economics. But that surely is a, a real indictment of the, the narrowing focus of pure economics. How do you break that up? How do you break that down? It is an indictment. And I think um, there is some recognition of this. There's certainly recognition of the lack of diversity problem and that a social science like economics should not have the same makeup as mathematics or computer science. You know, economics is very similar with that same kind of Silicon Valley bro culture, if I could put it like that, quite aggressive culture. So I think departments are trying there. But one of the reasons for the book is to try to land the message that it's not just about behaving nicely in seminars or looking a little bit wider when you're appointing people. It's also thinking about the breadth of the approach to economics that, um, that is permitted. Um, but I do think department heads um, in leading departments will have to talk to each other and agree collectively that they're going to look beyond that narrow bottleneck of the top five journals and only a certain kind of research. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I mean, how? I mean, it does seem completely stupid in in this uh, this digital era that you have five five journals that dominate this and. Um, you know how? How? I mean, is there any? Is there anything that the public uh, sphere can do here to to to? I don't know to uh, promote uh, heterodox thinking or at least wider thinking in the industry. 
Well, there are things. Um, students are incredibly good at pressing for change. And um, one of the reasons that I was involved in developing the core curriculum, the free online curriculum, which is much wider, started with student pressure in countries from here to Chile. Um, so that helps. Actually, I think if economics departments don't change, um, the public sphere will do it for them because there's a whole Twitter sphere and blog blogosphere. Do you call it the blogosphere? I'm not sure. But anyway, there is a much wider public debate about economics. Mm. A lot of people care about the subject, and um, I think econ economists in conventional departments will just, over time, lose their influence if they don't change. So I think the market, there will be market pressures. Yeah, so the, the, it's the, 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 the conventional economics departments are the cogs and you're the monsters, in some sense. You're the threat. That. I will be a monster. Mm -hmm. Okay, what? Um, let me ask you a, a, another question on this. I mean, it's... Uh, the externalities issue is is absolutely huge in economics, isn't it? I mean, how, how do you tackle the fact that economics has uh, the the economy as it stands at the present time is just rife with the kind of externalities that that, that models in the past were not really able to cope with? Uh, I mean, you talk a lot about the externalities in 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 the book. Um, just to expand a little bit on what you what you mean there. Well, this is um, a hard problem, so I'm not sure I've got an answer to it. Uh, traditionally, we've thought about externalities as, if you like, small add-ons. Um, uh, pollution is a, a, an externality. It's a byproduct of production. Clearly, it needs to be fixed. So you identify the problem and you fix it with um, a tax on the polluter. And that approach has been applied more recently to um, environmental externalities in farming, for example. And, I'm thinking about polluter pays mechanisms there. Um, the, the thing about digital is that it's all externalities, network effects, uh, whereby a service becomes more valuable to existing users the more people use it are absolutely inherent. Um, data, which now drives so much of the economy um, and production and consumption um, is, is all externalities as well because almost any data record is relational or the information value it provides is relational. If I post a photograph of my husband online, is it my photograph or his photograph? And there've been court cases about a wonderful image of a monkey in the rainforest that it took itself by triggering a camera, it was a selfie. And court cases have been fought over whether the photographer or the monkey or the public sphere own the rights to that piece of data. Um, even something very personal, like my temperature today, isn't really personal information because the information content to me comes from knowing the population average. And clearly there's a spillover to other people who might want to know if I've got a fever or not in current circumstances. So it's all externality. And the trouble is that um, we don't have a good way of analysing the trade-offs that that implies and particularly putting empirics around it. If you ask me how much is my data worth, well, there are online calculators and I can figure out that my data is worth about you know, 20 cents, not very much. And um, that's because the value comes from combining it with others. How valuable is the whole data set? We don't really have good methods for doing that. And that's something that I and many other people are trying to think about at the moment, but we need, we need some data. So to go back to the competition discussion, if I want to think about um, competition remedies against a, a big tech company that's accumulated a lot of data. I need to have some idea of the, the value of that to decide what kind of remedies are proportionate. So um, I think it's a, a huge um, unanswered question, which economists really ought to get on the case and start yeah. answering. And getting bigger all the time as data itself gets bigger all the time. Uh, one other thing that in the book, you you. Um, you talk quite a lot about welfare economics and you talk, I guess, saying that for a long time, welfare economics was sort of pushed into the margins and it needs to come back into the mainstream. Uh, what, what, what really do you mean by that? Well, I've got all the classics of uh, welfare economics on the shelves here and they date mainly from the late 1970s. There hasn't been much activity um, since then outside a sort of niche area looking at um, well-being and those kinds of measures. And um, this is because of that separation I mentioned between the positive and the normative, as Milton Friedman labelled it in a famous essay, 
we think what we do is the positive stuff. Uh, data, empirics, analyze the situation, work out the best answer. And that's something that dates from the logical positivism of the 1930s and Lionel Robbins and Keynes were uh, very much influenced by that. But you can't really separate it in that way. We need to try to be objective. Adam Smith's idea of the impartial spectator is very important if you want to advise on policy. But as soon as you start adjudicating as to whether something is better or the best outcome, we use this term efficient, as I said, but it's really a value judgment. And we don't have a very coherent way of thinking about that in a society in which any policy decision will have winners and losers. And that's because the economist concept of better is Pareto efficiency, the idea that you, if you make one person better off and nobody worse off, then that's an improvement. But you're always going to make somebody worse off with a policy decision. How do we start to think about that distributional framework and presenting empirical evidence, which we're so good at doing, in um, a structured context so that people who are taking the ultimate value judgments, the politicians, know where you're coming from and what kinds of value judgments you've already made. Mm. Well, let me bring you to COP26 and the rather meager results that came out of it. I mean, is, this is, a, this is how, how, do, how, how do you as an economist uh, try at the cutting edge of what's going on in, in, I guess, in welfare economics, view the outcome of COP26? And how more generally do you view the externalities of the environment, which are obviously going to, to affect us over the next uh, decade and decades, I guess? Well, this is obviously a political economy challenge. How do you get collective agreement at global scale when there are winners and losers? And um, nobody's found the answer to that. Um, it seems to me um, absolutely impossible to say to countries like China and India, you must not grow. And they are going to increase their use of energy over time. I think there will have to be compensation mechanisms. Um, having ex an explicit geopolitical conversation about winners and losers at a time of geopolitical tensions anyway is really hard. Um, what can economics do? I think, first of all, integrate better with the um, environmental evidence, and that's there's a lot of work in that area. So improving the interaction between economic models and what they say about people's behaviour and using behavioural economics and tying that to climate science or biodiversity science is well underway, really important interdisciplinary work. And that gives you the slow burn mechanism of presenting evidence in the public domain. Public pressure clearly really important in, in the politics of this. The other thought I have about it is um, inspired really by Thomas Schelling. And I took part in a workshop with him many years ago where he said, what we've chosen as a focal point for these negotiations isn't very useful because it's quite hard to measure and it's retrospective, this 1.5 degrees limit. Perhaps if we could switch the negotiations to um, a prospective or at least immediate metric um, about which there could be less, less argument and um, that tied in more directly to um, energy outcomes, that would be a more constructive way of doing it. Um, but, you know, I don't know, I don't have a solution. I think ultimately, this is going to be a mix of public pressure, particularly among younger people, because the generational shift is immense, absolutely immense. And, um, and stuff happening, crises prompt change, and we are going to see a lot more extreme weather events, climate migration and um, conflict as a result of what happens, unfortunately. In general, are you optimistic about uh, the ability of the economics profession to adapt to all the changes that you have uh, uh, laid out in your book and the challenges that you've laid out in your book? Are, or do you feel that, as it were, the forces of uh, reaction will uh, will win out in the end and this will become a sort of very ivory tower um, contemplation of one's navel kind of philosophy? I think I'm optimistic. Uh, economists respond to incentives and there will be <laughs> change. And there's a lot of interest. So even economists who disagree with what I say are actually very interested in this debate. And that's a good sign. 
Okay, on that happy note, can I uh, thank Professor Dan Coyle and can I thank all of you for watching? Please do read the book. It is, uh, as I say, a fascinating book, uh, Cox and Monsters, published by Princeton University Press. I think it came out last month. Uh, Dan's done quite a lot of uh, work around it and uh, promoting the book but it's it's as i say a good read but a challenging read and it takes you off into many 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 different uh, uh, areas and uh, it's worth a lot of bath time as a, a mutual friend of ours at the financial times is want to say many thanks thank you very much andrew great to talk to you